this evening, we're delighted to welcome from St. Mark's English Church in Florence, around the corner from the Institute in Via, del Mag Via Maggio, uh, Ellie Walker, uh, who is the Artistic Director at St. Mark's, which means really in charge of all the cultural and social programming that St. Mark's does, um, and it's a powerhouse of creativity, particularly on the music side. Um, Ellie arrived in Florence on this time uh, last summer when she was actually furloughed out of her job in the UK and vo uh, volunteered to work with the New Generation Festival on their remarkable uh, season of opera and orchestral music in the Bobbly Gardens, um, which was a triumph of, of spirit and will over the, uh, the COVID last summer. Um, and um, then when that came to an end, uh, the, her job in the UK said so didn't want it back. So she sang louder than ever in the quiet St. Mark's and they noticed her and gave her a job at St. Mark's instead, uh, which is great because it means we still got Ellie with us. Um, her background is she studied um, music and uh, uh, visual arts and history of art um, throughout her studies, culminating with a master's degree at the Courtauld Institute um, and has since then been freelancing in the arts world until she pitched up in the right place, which is Florence and St. Mark's. With that little brief introduction, I'm delighted to welcome Ellie Walker to give us her lecture on the patterns of patronage in Santa Spirito. Over to you, Ellie. Hey, thank you uh, so much, Simon, for that introduction. Um, and I hope uh, you can all see and hear me okay. It's a real pleasure to be with you all uh, virtually. Um, and I hope you're keeping safe and well during the pandemic. Um, so yes, I'm going to give a brief introduction to me and how I found myself in Florence. Um, and uh, when I was at the court of my master specifically looked at the Italian Renaissance. I mean, I've always loved art history, but um, I really wanted to specialise in the Italian Renaissance. But I looked at it with a, at a slightly different angle in that I looked at the influence of Netherlandish painting um, on 15th century Florence and the artwork that was produced mainly in the sort of 1450s to 1500, generally speaking. Um, and I did this with uh, my supervisor and tutor, Paula Nuttall, um, who, um, who, there we are, uh, at the British Museum, at the uh, the, uh, in Bruges on our, on our research trip in 2015. Um, and uh, when it came to choosing a topic for my dissertation, I was a little bit <laughs> overwhelmed um, when we were told to pick something original for uh, our topics. I thought, oh, for the Renaissance, everyone's written everything about the Renaissance already. Surely, how am I supposed to find something original? And uh, my mind wandered and it ended up uh, in my favourite area of Florence, which is the Old Trano, the uh, Santa Spirito in particular, um, the southern bank of Florence. And, um, and I sort of found my mind wandering towards the church of Santa Spirito and the Nerli altarpiece there. And it was Paula who encouraged me to dig a little deeper and see if I might find something interesting to write about um, with the, in regards to the Nerli altarpiece. And I found not one, not two, but three altarpieces um, which took my fancy and um, have a fascinating story to tell, which I hope you will uh, enjoy hearing about this evening. So the three altarpieces um, that I will talk about are uh, the Visitation by Piero di Cosimo, um, which is a, um, a wonderful altarpiece that now lives in, um, that lives in, uh, Washington DC, uh, and this is the Capone altarpiece. Uh, the Nerli altarpiece, the one that I mentioned before, in its original frame, in its original chapel, so it's really quite special, um, quite special out of all three of them. And um, the Nazi altarpiece by Raffaellino del Garbo, um, the Pieta, which um, is, is worthy of some attention, uh, I promise you. So these three altarpieces together, uh, were in neighbouring chapels in the right-hand transept of Santa Spirito, just here. And, um, and here they are today. Um, so this is uh, the Lippi altarpiece here, looking beautiful. Um, the Nazi altarpiece by Raffaellino del Garbo would have been here, and the Caponi altarpiece would have been just here. Um, they were all completed between 1480 and 1500. Um, and it was a really interesting time in Santa Spirito for art patronage because 
Santo Spirito suffered a fire in um, 15, no, sorry, 1471, uh, and it was reconstructed by 1482. Um, and all of these altar pieces were painted after that, um, at a time when the Augustinians, who were running the church and still do, um, and the opera of Santo Spirito, the committee, um, had a, quite a heavy influence on how they wanted their altar pieces to look. Um, here you have a sort of mock-up of how they would have originally perhaps looked like. Um, the sort of recipe for a chapel back then would have one long window, one with a, a crest at the top. The altarpiece had to have a, a Marian theme. It had to be square, had to have a gilded frame upon the altar and have a painted wooden altar front or a paliotto. So you see that in that mock-up that I did. And that's what we see today. There's no altar anymore, but um, uh, you can sort of imagine it. Um, and interestingly, they could also have a crest on the outside of the church. So you can see as you walk, which, which chapel belonged to which family and also how close they were to the high altar. So here you have <clears throat> um, two altar pieces um, from the northern transept, the opposite transept, um, earlier altar pieces. And you can see they have this sort of, this recipe, I suppose, where you have a Marian square altar piece with the Mary enthroned in the center with the child and saints either side, the sort of sacra conversazione that's known as uh, today with the wooden, pal uh, wooden paliotto in front. Botticelli tried to do something a little bit different. He replaced the wall behind with uh, that sort of hedge foliage that looks like three panels. Um, but nonetheless, they were all kind of a bit generic, to be honest, without, I mean, they're all beautiful, but they're all a bit sort of samey. And if we sort of cast our minds into the 21st century to Italian fashion that is still so brand focused today, 15th century art patronage in um, Florence was also very brand focused, or should I say, their appearance was everything. How families appeared to the public and other leading families in that area was so important. You know, whether they had the latest artists or the latest trends, um, and for those of you scholars among you who are listening tonight, I apologize when I say that art patronage was sort of like a prototype for Instagram. Stick with me here. Here you have your Instagram post set up. Um, and Instagram today is all about images. But in the 15th century, your hashtag trend came in the form of Netherlandish styles, Netherlandish motifs. And your image, instead of it being a selfie on the top of Palazzo Vecchio, would be your old piece. And yes, this is massively oversimplified, I get it, but it's not actually as different as you might think. So let's move on to the first old piece, the Capone old piece by Pierre de Cosme. So who were the Capone? The Capone were an old leading family um, of the Drago Verde district, which is a, a district in the Oltrano. And their lineage goes back to the 1260s and 70s. And in the 15th century, they were expanding their political base into Santa Spirito. And this altarpiece is the first of the three that we're discussing tonight um, that was painted. I have here a, a genealogy which I put together. And I don't mean to, to intimidate anyone. We only need to focus on two characters. This is Gino de Neri Caponi and Piero di Capone, his firstborn son. So Gino um, was a businessman and he really established the wealth of the family. He set up five businesses for his five sons, both in Italy and abroad. Um, he was a wool merchant, a silk merchant, and also worked in banking. So he would have had a lot of, um, his paths were crossed with the Medici. And we know that there was a lot of um, letters between him and uh, the Magnificent, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Um, they had a lot of sort of crossover. Um, he was a very, he was a society figure. He was on the Signora twice. He was Gonfalonier de Justizia as well. So he is a very well-known man. Um, with the Medici, he was on the Balia of Cosimo de Medici in 1448, and he was on the Council of Seventy uh, in 1480 with Lorenzo the Magnificent. So. 
it seems more that he was partisans with the Medici rather than a sort of competing family. Gino Zaneri writes a will in 1485, two years before he dies, um, and in it he stipulates that 500 florins had already been uh, spent on the decoration of the chapel in Santa Spirito. But in it he also details for his son, Piero, to take over the decoration of the chapel, and that involved commissioning Piero di Cosimo for the altarpiece. So Piero Piponi, um, who was considered as the, the man who, who uh, commissioned Piero di Cosimo, was also a silk merchant. Um, but interestingly, he was one of five ambassadors who was sent uh, to Pisa in 1494 to meet King Charles VIII of France, who was in fact threatening to invade Florence at this time. And they were sent with the mission of coming back with a peace treaty, which is what they did. They came back with this peace treaty, and this particular event is really important to remember uh, for later on um, in respect to one of the other old pieces. So why Piero de Cosimo? I mean, what makes him so special? Why choose him for this really important altarpiece? Well, if we met him today, um, he probably would be a bit strange. Um, Vasari, in his Lives of Artists, he describes Piero de Cosimo as wild, eccentric, um, diligent at the expense of his health. Um, and interestingly, Vasari also includes a detailed description of the visitation. So here's the 15th century Italian. I won't expect you all to read it. Here's the translation. Um, and I think it's really lovely because he picks out some really, really lovely details. For example, St. Anthony, who is reading, wearing a pair of spectacles on his nose, a very lively figure. Here he counterfeited an old parchment book which appears to be real, and the balls of St. Nicholas have a certain luster and glimmer and reflect one another, showing the strangeness of his, Piero de Cosimo's brain, and how he sought out and depicted difficult things. So it would appear, according to Vasari, that Cosmo, Piero de Cosimo was really not your average artist. He's very innovative um, and really sought out difficult things to paint realistically. So let's look at these golden balls. I mean, they are very beautifully painted and you can even see a small interior reflected on the shimmery surface. And if you think that Piero di Cosimo was really had in mind where this altarpiece would sit, I'd like to think that that's the interior of Santo Spirito in the 15th century. And there are even small figures that you can see, the little black um, dots here, I would like to think are, are people within the church. Um, so his talent was obviously well known for depicting things realistically, but he was also a favourite of Piero uh, di Francesco del Pugliese, um, who was a very big, big cheese in uh, the Drago Verde. He was a very successful art patron and silk merchant and a wool merchant as well. Um, so no doubt Caponi, who were also silk merchants and wool merchants, um, would have crossed paths with um, Pugliese and perhaps might have been influenced by the way that he chose artists for, um, or who he chose for his old pieces. Um, perhaps the Caponi really wanted something special, unique and high quality and so chose um, Piero di Cosimo to, to do that. And I think they chose really well. Um, if we have just a closer look at this old piece, it's Marian and it is square. So it ticks those two things that the Augustinians and the opera or the committee of Santo Spirito wanted from their old pieces. But that's pretty much as far as it goes. Everything else is very innovative. The subject itself, the visitation, is usually reserved only for frescoes, and here it's oil on board. Um, and it's a certain twist, I think, on the theme of a sacra conversazione with the Virgin Mary surrounded by saints. She's still there, and she's still surrounded by saints, and they still, in a way, got a similar composition, but it's slightly different. Um, the balance of colour, I think, is gorgeous. I mean, look at how Piero de Cosimo is using the colour red to guide your eye around the painting. So here's St Nicholas with his beautiful red cloak. And then Mary has this wonderful red undergarment. 
And then this kind of brownie red as well. Then there's the red in the background and finally this glimmer of red here with St. Anthony. Um, I think the, there's a really bright quality of light here, almost stark, um, which is where the beginning of Netherlandish style and motif begins to come in because you have this really bright, stark light in Netherlandish paintings, religious paintings in particular. Um, and there's these narrative scenes going on in the background, which are very strange. You have the nativity here and the massacre of the innocents here. And the Pierre de Cosimo really does go into detail, not just in the background there, which we'll look into further in a minute, but also in the foreground. I'd like to also draw your attention to how much tension Pierre de Cosimo spends on nature. So look at this rocky outcrop and all these leaves here, but notice this tree, which is in full leaf, which echoes the shape of Mary's body and is just behind Mary showing her fertility at this point. And here you have a, a, a bit of a bearer tree and um, perhaps echo St Elizabeth who um, found it difficult to conceive a child and this is the miracle when she um, conceived the child with John the Baptist and Mary with baby Jesus. So let's just go into a bit more detail here into the background. Um, as you'll see, the architecture here is not really Italian. In fact, there are these staple, uh, stepped gabled rooftops, the type that you see in um, Amsterdam, Bruges, uh, Antwerp, all of these centers that Florentines were, had sort of buildings and uh, roots and banking and the tapestry trade and paintings that were coming back from the Netherlands into Florence. Obviously, Pierre de Cosimo must have seen um, must have seen some of these paintings here. Even these figures leaning out the windows as well. I mean, that's very, you can imagine like a Dutch scene or something um, with these figures leaning out the windows and even having a narrative element in the background is a bit of an Italian adaptation of a Netherlandish motif. I also love the, the, the different materials and different textures in this painting. I mean, look at the sort of old skin on the hand and then the parchment just flopping over, the beautiful robe that's sort of gathered around his feet, the bell, and even this, I think, is, is almost like a still life um, with the book halfway off the step and this walking stick casting the shadow. It's all very sort of creating a realistic and illusionistic appearance, which in itself is very typical of Flemish painting. And here's the book that Vasari talks about, with St. Nicholas thumbing the pages. I mean, you can just imagine him sitting there. I mean, I do it myself where you're about to turn the page or you're just thumbing the next page, ready to turn uh, to the next page. Um, and how the shimmery surfaces of these golden balls contrast with the, the blue cloth of Mary's cape and, and the stones, sharp stone steps. I mean, it's just a feast, a real feast for the eyes. Some more details here. I mean, this fior di vacca or a wallflower in the front is almost botanical in the way it has been depicted. Um, and this detail here, I mean, it looks like a monkey, but it's probably a cat um, um, walking along the banister. I mean, Piero di Cosimo was really obviously quite an obsessive artist with wanting to, to predict, pre, um, pre, to show uh, detail and, and give the illusion that everything was real when you're looking at it. Just another detail of those golden balls, I think they're really beautiful. Um, so I think the Piero, I think Piero Caponi chose well because this is really would have been such a departure and such a change from those Sacra Conversazioni um, compositions and old pieces that we saw just briefly beforehand. And it really would have shown the Caponi as quite distinguished and, and forward thinking patrons. So now let's move on to the Filipino Nipi and the Nerli old piece. So um, this is uh, all about family. Um, it was restored in 2011, so it's looking particularly beautiful. And I apologize, I tried my best to get the best images I could, but there's no sort of really good close-ups of it after um, restoration that I could find available online. Um, here you have, um, St. Uh, Mary with uh, Christ and John the Baptist, St. Martin here and St. Catherine, and the family patrons here. 
Tanai Nerli and his wife Giovanna. The family crests are everywhere here. I mean, if you imagine, you would have had the, the window with the crest at the top as well. These two crests at the top of the pilasters. And interestingly, crests down here too. Um, and these crests are particularly interesting because here you have the Caponi, um, no, sorry, the Nerli family chest crest. And here, it's difficult to see, you have to see it in real life, um, the Caponi family crest. So you have the maternal, and paternal family crest because Giovanna was originally a Capone. So she was aunt to Piero who commissioned uh, the Capone altarpiece, the visitation. So here you have Piero Capone's aunt. So there's blood relations between the Nerli family and the Capone family. Also, Giovanna, in my eyes, is a heroine because she had 15 children and she still was able to, to walk. I mean, what an amazing woman. But here's a sort of very limited Nerli um, family tree. And there are the, the family crests again. So let's just take a closer look at these, old, at these uh, portraits because I think it really shows Filipinos Lippi's skills in portraiture. Um, so here you have Tanai Nerli, the patron, who is really beautifully portrayed. There's such a soft rendering of the shadow on his face and he's quite dynamic. He's looking up, he's engaging with the holy company who are in front of him. That hand raised, it's almost like he's just raised his head from prayer and is really looking and seeing the Virgin Mary in front of him. And then Giovanna, on the other hand, is slightly more uh, static, yes. She's in profile and she's on her knees praying. But this kind of depiction of a portrait of a lady of her stature is very appropriate. Um, you know, she's shown as a devoted Christian wife looking at Virgin Mary, but perhaps not seeing the Virgin Mary maybe as much or as vividly as Tanai is there. And it's worth noting here that it's unusual, in fact, unique in Santa Spirito to have these two portraits. There are no other old pieces at this time that had portraits of patrons. Um, so that in itself would have looked very, very different from what came beforehand. The portraits of the saints as well, I think, are really quite beautiful. Um, Mark St. Martin here, um, look at the way that Nerly has included that vein on his head and the soft rendering of the skin and you can see that he's really taken a lot of trouble to create a very human saint. And this is a drawing from the Louvre of Tanai. There's been some uh, discussion as to whether it's um, St. Martin, but I think that profile is much more Tanai Nerly. But obviously portraits were very important um, on show, very, very uh, much wanted them to look uh, like the, uh, the patrons. And here's the connection between Piero de Cosimo and Filippino Lippi. There isn't any actual documents that link the two artists together, but if we look at this example here, there's undoubtedly a link between the two artists. On the left is Filippino Lippi's Bach Madonna, and on the right is Piero de Cosimo's Madonna and Child. And you can see by the position of Mary, the child, look at how he plays with the scripture as a children, as a child would, you know, scrumpling up the pages, that sound that it would have made to a young child. And even her hand that softly cradles his, uh, his lower knee is the same here. And interestingly, this background, this view into the distance, um, which itself is a very Netherlandish trait, Netherlandish portraits. Interestingly, this um, is also in the Nerli altarpiece. So this image, you only really need to concentrate on the blue line here, which is the original line of the composition, which is the same as the Nerli here, the uh, Lippi here, the same position of the Virgin Mary. But then he changed it at a later date to have her looking towards St. Catherine, possibly to better frame the background here, which we'll go into in a few, in a, in, in a few minutes. Lippi was also a favorite of Pugliese. Here he is cropping up again, this famous art patron of the Drago Verde. And there's a beautiful double portrait here of the two. Uh, here's Lippi himself and here's Pugliese. I mean, perhaps, um, perhaps 
Pugliese recommended Lippi to the Nerli family. The Nerli family were also silk merchants, again, all within the same community of Drago Verde. And it was a small community that was known to be quite fiercely independent. So perhaps there's a certain element of protecting their own and, um, and suggesting artists to the patrons uh, of their own district. But there's also an interesting pattern that crops up between the artists who have already had paintings, already had old pieces commissioned in this church, and uh, the later old pieces in the 1480s and 90s. So here on the left, you have Cosimo Rosselli, um, who was the master to Piero de Cosimo. And then you have Botticelli here, whose old piece is in the northern transept, who was master of Filippino Lippi. And finally, you have Filippino Lippi, who was master of Raffaellino del Garbo, who's the final altarpiece that we'll come on to just in a minute. I mean, perhaps these links were to ensure some kind of stylistic continuity. Um, who knows? But there's definitely this pattern here, which is, I think, quite, quite fascinating. So let's look at these two altarpieces together. I think they really beautifully complement each other visually. Um, both of them have this uh, stage like smooth foreground um, with some still life details. I mean, you'll have to go and see the altarpiece yourselves when you are able to come back to Florence um, because this cartwheel here, I mean, the splintered wood is really amazingly portrayed. And the shelf up here with the Bishop's Mitre and the book, these sort of still life elements are echoed as well in um, the Piero di Cosmo. And again, the use of red, look at how Filipino uses the use of red to guide your eye across the painting. Um, even this little bridge of red here with the figure in the background, that I will come on to. Um, and finishing here with St. Catherine. It's such a rich display of colors, which goes so well with Piero di Cosimo. Um, but most importantly, of course, are the Netherlandish traits. We've mentioned the uh, still life details and possibly also the, the light, uh, the light here, the like clear, crisp light that you also get in Piero de Cosimo. But interesting, the background with these towers um, and these blue hills and the green vegetation in the background is very similar to Netherlandish paintings from that time, such as the Hans Memling and the Dirk Bouts here. But this background scene is worthy of a little bit more attention. Um, there's a lot of scholarship <laughs> on this scene, and, and I can't even dream to go into the middle of it, but basically what we're looking at is uh, likely to be Porta San Frediano of Florence, and this is likely to be Tanai Merli himself in a red ambassadorial outfit. Because interestingly, Tanai Nerli, the patron of the Nerli altarpiece, was also one of the five men that went on the 1494 ambassadorial mission to Pisa to get the peace treaty with Charles VIII of France. And actually, there are more links um, with this painting and that ambassadorial mission in the choice of saints. Um, because to begin with, when you look at the painting, the choice of saints is perhaps a little strange. Um, St. Catherine and Giovanna, there's no sort of immediate name relation there. The same with Tanai, whose real name was Jacob uh, or Jacopo. Um, there's no sort of immediate relation between him and St. Martin. But when we think about what the saints perhaps represent, it becomes a little clearer. St. Martin was the patron saint of France, and St. John the Baptist down here is the patron saint of Florence. These are the two cities that were involved in the peace treaty. St. Catherine uh, represents the actual day the treaty was formally signed on the 25th of November, 1494, which was her feast day. Um, so actually the whole altarpiece is pointing towards this diplomatic mission and how important it must have been for the Nerli family at the time, but also connects the Nerli family with the Capone, their blood relations, the chapel next but one. So visually, this painting is connected to the Pierre de Cosmo, and actually, you know, physically in the choice of saints and the referencing the diplomatic mission, it connects to the Capone. So these really strong ties with uh, the Capone. 
Yes, the composition perhaps is a little bit more traditional and that it looks a little bit more like the um, old pieces that we saw beforehand, but it still has these Netherlandish traits which run throughout it, which makes it very, very unique. And so finally, this is the Nazi old piece by Raffaellino del Garbo, um, a bit of a mouthful um, and perhaps not your household name, but you'll see that he really is the final piece in the puzzle and fits beautifully like a sort of Renaissance sandwich uh, between the two other old pieces. So who were the Nazi? They're a little bit more elusive, um, but they are nonetheless a very important family of the Drago Verde district again. Um, and the only two we really need to remember is Bernardo and Filippo Nazi, um, who are likely to have commissioned this altarpiece. Who was uh, Raffaellino del Garbo? Well, um, he was important enough to feature in uh, Vasari's Lives of Artists. He had quite a short career of about 20 years and his style disintegrated over that, I think because he was a bit of a drinker. Um, but there is some confusion about him because um, he has 10 different names, <laughs> um, but all we really need to concern ourselves with tonight are uh, number one and uh, number two and three, because you'll notice a name that is perhaps recognizable, the Caponi, and here Caponi Bus, which is the Latinized version of Caponi. Um, so the story of Raffaellino del Garbo is that he was actually adopted by the Caponi family. He was briefly in Perugino's workshop and then was apprenticed to Filipino Lippi. And the Nazi and the Caponi were cousins, their families married in the 15th century. Um, so there's already a lot of links between this artist, the Caponi and the Nazi family. Let's have a little look at this altarpiece. I'd just like to say that I was very fortunate enough to be seeing this altarpiece uh, sort of backstage at the Artepinacotec in Munich when I was researching this, thanks to Dr. Andreas Schumacher, who showed me this painting and supplied all the images. And um, Dr. Annette Hoyer, who discussed with me the dating of this old piece and lots of other details that was found uh, when there was a lot of research on this old piece back in 2015. So thanks to them for these beautiful images. Um, this composition is actually a very northern European composition in that it is a northern Vesper built composition, and that is with the Christ lying horizontally across Mary's lap like that. There's also a use of Devota Maniera in this painting, which is these woeful expressions, the tears, the bloodshot eyes, and you can see this clearly in, the, in um, Mary Magdalene here, um, who I think is just such a beautiful face, um, albeit heartbreaking, but beautiful. Devota Maniera was actually on the rise in Florence in the 1490s, thanks to a certain fairly extremist monk, Savonarola, um, who campaigned, campaigned for simple, devout imagery. Um, and we know that Alessandro Nazi, who's the nephew of Bartolomeo, who's likely to have commissioned the altarpiece here, um, had a large collection of devotional imagery, including three Flemish religious pieces. So the Nazi family would, would have been very much in touch with uh, Flemish art. But the background details are also fascinating um, because there are similarities, a lot of similarities between the Garbo and Roger van der Weyden here. If you notice, we zoom in a little bit further. There's almost a direct quote here of this building in the Wyden and the Garbo. Now, it's impossible to say that Garbo saw the Wyden and copied it immediately like that. But it suggests that there are um, perhaps cartoons or studio workbooks that uh, are going around at this time with these patterns that artists would draw into the background of their altarpieces. And note this stepped gabled roof again. This is not an Italian building. This is a Flemish building. Um, and the same I would say here. I mean, Garbo seems to have looked at the same textbook, so to speak, that Wyden had, had been looking at. 
um, I would say that's a sort of variation on a theme. So at this point, I'd like to introduce the Portinari altarpiece. This is one of the most important altarpieces in Florence in the 15th century. Um, and its importance really should not be overlooked when we just talk about artworks in the late 15th century Florence. This altarpiece arrived on the 28th of May in 1483. And it was a big deal. It was also, it's massive, it's huge. It's in the uh, Nifizzi, so please go and have a look at it when you're, when you're next in Florence. It was unloaded from a ship in Pisa and transported through Porta San Frediano to Santa Maria Nuova by 16 porters. And I like to think that it passed through the Drago Verde uh, district, which was en route, um, and passed the Caponi household whilst Raffaellina del Garbo was there as a child, because the Caponi were involved with its transportation from Bruges to Pisa. So why wouldn't they let this magnificent artwork pass by their front door, so to speak? And in fact, even though Raffaellina del Garbo painted his altarpiece 10 years later, I think you can still see a certain influence of this altarpiece on Raffaellina del Garbo. Specifically with the Mary Magdalene here, you can see this sort of soft oval moon-shaped face um, with this auburn hair tricking down her shoulders. Very, very similar to the Virgin Mary in the Portinari altarpiece. Um, but also the cityscapes in the background and this sort of this scattering of plants in the foreground is, is very similar to the treatment of, of nature in, um, the Portum, in the Raffaellino del Garbo altarpiece. But it goes a step further even with Raffaellino del Garbo's actual use and application of paint because it was discovered that Raffaellino actually use tempera in the under layers of his painting, which you can sort of see here, this sort of short brush stroke on her neck, which is the sort of application of tempera that is needed, and also sort of around her eyes, and then contrast that with John the Baptist's face, which looks a lot more fleshy and modelled. And that's because Raffino added layers of oil paint on top of tempera. So it's a real kind of epitome of Netherlandish styles and Netherlandish techniques coming into Italian painting. And this is a, again seen in the use of gold in this painting, because it was very Italian to add gold leaf to a painting. Whereas in Nether the Netherlands, they used white and yellow to imitate the effects of gold. And Raffaellino does both. So you have these golden halos here on this beautiful, tragically sad angel. But then on the embroidery, he uses white and yellow and these sort of golden toggles here to give the effect of this shimmering gold thread. You can see it again here on the bottom of the cape of the Mary Magdalene um, on her sandals as well. So it really is showing how these Netherlandish influences were making their way into Italian uh, artworks. So the link with, um, I mean, why, why would they choose Garbo? I mean, obviously there's this link with Filippino Lippi. He was a student and apprentice of Lippi, but also his style was very similar, the treatment of the background and the treatment of these long figures, the lines, the, the, the drapery which falls down in this uh, long sort of rectangular forms. But there's also a fascinating connection with Perugino. Oh, and also, may I say, Pugliese, here he is again. Here's the Pugliese, the big cheese of the uh, Drago Verde, the Oltrano. He also likes Lippi, as we know, and this beautiful, beautiful altarpiece was commissioned um, and is in the Badia of Florence, um, which I've yet to see. But this was well known to be a masterpiece at the time. So Lippi was very popular uh, back then. And I think you can see when we look back at the Garbo, there's a lot of similarity with the treatment of landscape as, uh, as, as Lippi does. But back to Perugino here. Perugino, um, obviously, um, Raffaellino del Garbo was briefly in his workshop, um, but the Nazi actually had this painting here commissioned for their church, uh, for their chapel in Cestello. And they loved it. They thought it was fantastic. Um, and they highly praised uh, the way in which Perugino had uh, put this, this composition together and the use of light. Um, and 
when we see Perugino's Pietà, it's almost identical to Raffaellino del Garbo's. Um, it's almost like Raffaellino has taken the sort of a copy and placed it um, into this out, uh, external nature, uh, into this external scene. And what is fascinating as well is that there is a drawing by Perugino, which has this Pieta in, uh, in the outdoors, in the outdoors. I mean, whether Raffaellino saw this, it's very difficult to say, but we know that maybe there were plans for a painting um, that Raffaellino perhaps was able to, to, to see. Again, here we've got uh, Raffaellino del Garbo's resurrection here and Perugino, so his style was clearly uh, imitating uh, this artist as well, a popular artist with the commissioning family of Amazi. So, you know, per, uh, Raffaellino del Garbo combined the styles of two favoured artists of the area and of his family. He, um, he was able to include these Netherlandish uh, styles and motifs in the background, in the detail to nature, in this Devota Maniera style. And he's really establishing his reputation with this altarpiece because it was the first big commission that he got. And it sort of worked because he got three other commissions from families in Santa Spirito for their altarpieces after having seen this piece. Perhaps Raffaellino was also impressing Caponi, um, his adoptive family, who were just in the chapel next door, and therefore also linking um, himself with the Caponi and the Nazi linking the families together. And also he knew he would be next to his master, Filipino Lippi. So he had to sort of come up to scratch next to the, the master that was Lippi. So these three altar pieces, I think, really beautifully visually connect to one another in this little corner of Santa Spirito. Um, and it's a really unique time because after 1500, there was a new opera, a new committee, um, and a really an aesthetic shift. And so everything changes after 1500. And so this, this collection of paintings is really very special. I guess the pattern of patronage, so to speak, is more communal and supportive um, rather than competitive, as we might expect, at least in this example. And I would even go so far as to say that it's really the Nerli and the Nazi, i.e. the Lippi and the Del Garbo, that are seeking to emulate the Caponi here in this beautiful, beautiful altarpiece. And by doing so, they really distinguished themselves and connected these three families together. Um, and I think the connecting thread, as well as the, the use of colour, is this Netherlandish flavour that is really strong in all of them. I think that's about time, um, but I hope you have enjoyed my uh, presentation. It's been a real pleasure going through all these images with you. And if you have any questions, please fire away. Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, if you want to unshare, then the, the thumbnails can pop up and we can invite people to switch on their videos if they want to yeah, yeah, see yeah. us and be seen. Um, um, I've just changed GP practices as well because oh, I'm. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, and so, as is our, our uh, practice, there's two ways to ask questions or make comments. One is in the chat, and we've already got a couple. The other is simply to unmute yourself and uh, um, raise your hand. Is some you got? Okay, is, that, is the way I'm seeing it. Don't worry. Um, okay, so in the um, in the chat, we got the question from Gwen. Um, how did the the second two altar pieces end up outside of Santa Spirito in Florence. Um, How did they? What, what happened? I'm there? not entirely sure of their of their journeys, but um, but one did end in Munich and one ended. I think the Munich story. I think the Raffaele del Garbo was in the family until the 1600s, and then it was given to the um, to a German family, and then ended up in the Alpine Aquatec. From what I remember, I'm not quite sure of the journey of the visitation to America, but um, it would be one that I would perhaps look into for further research. 
Mm. I, I hope it, somebody paid a lot of money for it to, yes. uh, to yeah. keep the church roof on. Um, <laughs> another question coming in earlier from Anna Pelagotti, um, referring to um, the, uh, the the background, I think, of the Filipino Lippi, I think she was talking about. Uh, so could, uh, this, could it be a real city? So the background of the Filipino Lippi is, I think, supposed to include Florence, of uh, Portus and Frediano. Um, but the backgrounds of the visitation and the um, Raffalini Lagabo are imagined cities. They're not a, a recognizable city. Um, they're sort of fantastical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Graham, you have your hand up, so please unmute and fire away. Thanks for a fascinating uh, survey, Ellie. Um, in the Capone altarpiece, the visitation, um, so Nicholas is holding a book and St. Anthony is holding a parchment. Do you know what they are? Yes, um, so the, I can't, I don't know what the parchment, what he's writing, um, but the, uh, the book is a, is a passage from the, from the Bible and it's, it is legible and I can, I can send those details on the, um, on the presentation afterwards if, if Simon would like, but there is a, a passage that is legible from the Bible. Before we take the next question, I'd just like to take the opportunity to welcome the Reverend Nick Fisher, who I see is with us, to uh, Florence. Uh, Nick, who I've yet to meet, so this is hello, Nick, and I'm Simon, um, has arrived quite recently um, to be the, the, uh, the vicar or chaplain of uh, St. Mark's Church for the next several months. Um, so you're most welcome, and I'm sorry we can't see more of you in person at the moment, but hopefully things will improve as the summer comes through. So that's Nick Fisher at the top there. Okay, um, other questions um, or comments? As I say, don't, you don't even have to put your hand up. You can just unmute and, and speak. Hi, Ellie. It's Tristan here. Awesome. I've got a question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Great talk. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking, uh, I know Jura a little and how, how Jura travelled to Venice and also to the Low Countries. Uh, which influences style. I wonder if any of these artists uh, from Florence around this time might have traveled to the Low Countries or to the Germanic yeah, lands. I mean, it's a really fascinating idea. We did talk about this um, in my master's and there's no actual sort of documentation. It's very difficult to sort of track people's movements. Um, and I don't think we're aware of any movements from these three artists up to the Netherlands, but I would like to think that maybe Piero di Cosimo or Lippi got up there in some way because there's so many um, strong references to the Netherlands um, in their artwork, specifically Piero di Cosimo. Um, it's fascinating to think of them heading up to Bruges and doing a little study trip themselves and then coming back and, um, and producing these beautiful artworks. But um, no, there's no documentation of them being there. Right, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. They maybe had a, a, a early Renaissance Erasmus program going. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of. I mean, I think probably it's the patrons and these merchants. I mean, that were in Bruges and Antwerp that were trading and bringing artworks back um, into Florence. Um, that artists in Florence were able to to see these artworks, as seen obviously with the Portinari, but there were all these portraits that were so popular that were coming back from the Netherlands into Florence. Um, so I think there's there's all this sort of influx of these wealthy merchants coming back with these goodies from the north, um, which would have maybe tapped into the Italian styles. Yeah. I, I'll take... Um advantage of the slight lull in the questions and answers to um, thank everybody very sincerely who's been making donations um, to support the Wednesday lecture series. Um, it is vital to us at this difficult time that these contributions and it's much appreciated. So um, please, if you have not already donated, considered so doing, and if you've donated before and feel like doing it again, that's also welcome. The ground rules are very simple. Whatever you feel comfortable with is most welcome. And Sarah puts up the link to our just giving um, page in the chat just to help you. Otherwise, you can easily find it online or repeatedly in the What's On On Mondays. So um, thank you very much for what you're doing and um, please uh, 
continue to help us out as we fight our way through the second half of, hopefully, the pandemic. So we'll see. Brenda, a question, comment. Hello, uh, Ellie. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that, and I can't wait to get back to Santo Spirito. Um, just to, could you elaborate? You touched a little bit on uh, one of the artists uh, using oil. Mm -hmm. Could you? Because I, I'm aware that the Netherlandish were very important uh, for the Italians to start using oil. Yes. Talk a little bit more about that. Yes, so um, there's all sorts of um, stories on how oil came to Italy, but it did. Um, and um, it really allowed artists to create more illusionistic and realistic painting because the actual refraction of light within a particle of oil is more than within tempera when they use the egg. Um, and so it created these really beautiful, vibrant colours that artists obviously fell in love with. Um, and so Italian artists were learning how to use oil. Um, and they're sort of not quite ready to let go of temporary yet because, you know, that's what they knew. And here you see Raffaellino del Garbo obviously being trained in oil, in, sorry, in tempera, um, because he obviously needed to know tempera for any fresco commissions. Um, but oil obviously was in demand and, and it survived better as well. I mean, it's, it's more hard wearing than, than temper, which is so fragile. Um, so yeah, that painting I think is just fascinating how he starts in temper with his safety zone almost, and then moves into oil, the slightly more complex, uh, complex medium. Yeah. And the Portinari was in oil, wasn't it? Yes, it was, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of the, I think most of the majority of uh, paintings from Northern Europe um, at this time were in oil paint. Um, and that's how they were able to have this sort of Northern Renaissance where they produce these really illusionistic paintings. I mean, there's a portrait of a lady in the National Gallery with a fly on her wimple. Um, you know, they really like to sort of try and trick the eye. And this was all coming into, into Florence when the Italian artists wanted to do the same. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's a couple of comments and a question in the chat, which we'll do now. Mm -hmm. So Anna Pelagotti comments, I've been doing I've been doing diagnostics investigations with art test on the Palanelli during the restoration and what was discussed at the time was that the references to the northern landscapes were homages to the merchant activities of the Florentine families. Yes. Sort of what you're suggesting, yes. Ellie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Christine reminds us that around 2004 there was an excellent exhibition at the PT on the influence of Netherlandish artists on the Italian Renaissance painters. So, um, oh, I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe we could get Ike to put it back on again for you. <laughs> yeah. no, um, it's a really question, fascinating. But a question from Susan Gavin. Sorry, uh, I guess, question from Susan Gavin. Um, was the widespread ex acceptance and understanding of seeing patrons in the scenes from the Bible? Um, I mean, I think there was acceptance. I'm just trying to think. I mean, there's the frescoes in the Tr Santa Trinita, which they have scenes from the Bible and portraits of the patrons. So I think it's not uncommon to see them. But in this particular case, it was unusual for Santa Spirito to have these two portraits of the patrons feature so prominently. Um, so I think they would definitely know that they are the patrons and understand that these are the two who commissioned the artwork. I mean, Nerli, Tanai Nerli is actually buried in that chapel, so um, he's still there and we can go and say hello. Um, but um, yes, I, I, I believe there was. And the, the Tornabuoni family are very prominent in um, the Gil and Dia frescoes behind the altar in, in Santa Maria Novella. Yes. Uh, um, they're interestingly next door in, in the Palazzo, in the Capello Strozzi, which Filippino Lippi did a, a little bit later. Um, there's no sign of any patrons or portraits. It's all much more austere because, of course, we've had several. Savannah Rona. Savannah Rona. Between those two pieces, which were only a few years apart, but extraordinarily different. You can really see the impact there. Yeah. 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 Very fascinating. Yeah. 
Um, if so, I have a oh. question, sorry. Um, so it's, yeah. Sorry, I've got a baby here as well. He's gonna make. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, with the different artists, <laughs> no, <laughs> they, they talk to one another. Sorry, bad timing. If they talk to one another and if we have any evidence of letters or anything like that, um, I'd be interested to know maybe the relationship between them. And I'm going to mute myself really quickly. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Um, yeah, um, there's no, so there's no documentation between Pierre de Cosimo and Filippino Lippi. There's nothing that survives, but I think they must have been aware of each other's work. They're both competing for patrons in the same city district. They were both arrived alive at the same time to each other. Um, and there's that similarity between the two paintings that I showed, the, the two Madonnas and Childs. Um, so there's no literature between them, but then obviously Rafaelina del Garbo and was a student of Filipino Lippi. So they would have very much been in touch with each other and learning from one another. Well, Rafaelina del Garbo learning from Filipino Lippi. So definitely between those two, yes, yeah. Yeah. Good, good to see you introducing the baby to the nation so early, Kate. <laughs> any more for any more? Just one, Pen one, one yeah, small Pen thing. Um, I, I wouldn't, uh, I'm not too familiar. Where exactly is that district? Where does it extend? Um, it extend I think district? it's, I'm not entirely sure myself. I think it's sort of, if you are standing in um, Santa Spirito, I think it's the area to the left. If you're looking at the church, it sort of extends to the left towards Porto San Frediano, that kind of area of, um, of Santa Spirito, of the Octrana. Okay, thank you. Penny <laughs> Howard reminds us that the Masaccio in Santa Maria Novella also has donors on the fresco of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. find them, you'll find them around if you keep your eyes open. Sometimes very yeah. quite a crop up every now and then. <laughs> okay, any more for any more? Um, or are we getting to the time where we want to thank Ellie very much for her wonderful lecture? Ellie, in the chat, there's all sorts of um, people. Yeah, I'm seeing um, anything pop up. <laughs> so I think you can consider it's been a triumph. And thank you very much indeed for the great contribution to the. Um, Wednesday lecture series. Um, more to come through the rest of the spring and into the summer. Uh, so stay with us and um, look forward to seeing you all next week. And don't forget to sign up for your medieval art history seminars as well. If you want to get stuck into that, that's all starting next week too. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, thanks Thank very you much. much. Thank you. It was a great talk. Well done. Um, and lovely to see you all, all tonight and uh, see you all again soon. And one day again, in presenza, Afrenze. Okay, guys. Good Thank night. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye.